everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping in. Hope everybody is having a great week to this point. Um, you know the routine. If you like what you see in here, hit the like button. Uh, hit the share button. And if you really like it, hit the subscribe button. Uh, and for the people who literally have a problem with that uh, statement, I don't know what to tell you uh, because I'm going to do it. But anyway, I'll get to that maybe later. But anyway, man, um, I thought that uh, Shannon Sharp on Club Shay Shay was at his pinnacle in his interview with Cat Williams just simply because how things were aired out and the things that were uh, exposed in that particular interview. But this interview with comedian and actor uh, Monique, uh, it is rivaling it. Uh, definitely not as entertaining, although there are definitely some good moments, but not as entertaining and as wide open or wild as the Cat Williams interview, but that's Cat. Uh, but as far as hitting hard, pulling no punches, using no filters, and calling a spade a spade, this interview is on point. And for the record, uh, before I get started on why it was important for me to talk about this uh, so soon afterwards, um, I want to be very clear. My goal here isn't in defense of Monique, it's in defense of the truth. Um, if she happens to be telling the truth and it happens to be in a way that bring for, brings forth clarity about some of the things that are negatively not impacting uh, blacks, and, and this is the thing that's clear to me. Because the first thing I want to make clear is this is me in defense of the truth and me in pointing out some things that drive me and why I'm passionate about what I do when I'm addressing how the media moves. Because at the end of the day, this is the backdoor play of what's going on behind the scenes of the content that we get in our movies, we get in our television shows, we get in our music uh, and so forth. And the people who are put in front of us, one of the most dangerous things, I said this before um, a long time ago, that one of the most dangerous uh, people to black progress is a black face with a white agenda. And you see this in our entertainment industry again whether it's in television whether it's in the movies whether it's in uh music is the black people that they put up not the players the players play a role too but the players are trying to get paid and remember this is about money everything is about money this is a capitalist society so everything is about money so when everything is about money other things start to suffer like mor morals values conservative interests and principles conserving interests and principles all these different things that are the little ground a foundation of how you uphold a family, how you uphold a community, how you uphold a racial structure is values, interests, and principles. One of the first things they took away from us were values, interests, and principles associated with our history. They took that away from us and they uh, uh, transposed or superimposed their own values, interests, and principles are the, uh, the constructs and rules that uh, demanded we behave a certain way that would support and underwrite their values, interests, and principles. And one of the first things that we are going to have to be honest with ourselves about is that different people from different racial backgrounds, different, different socioeconomic backgrounds, the wealthy elite versus the, the poor, the middle class, and the affluent, which are all not part of the wealthy elite, their values, their interests, and their principles are different than ours because of how they create the lifestyle that they enjoy and how we play a role in it. And so when we are looking at all these things, we must break it down and examine it. So um, 
one of the things that I am noticing that is happening on uh, Club Shay Shay with Shannon Sharp is there have been several interviews. Obviously, Cat Williams is the most noted, and now we have this interview with Monique. Uh, but basically, it has become a ground where people can speak their truth and not be censored um, and be allowed to, to really truly come forth and explain without all of the cameos and snapshots and screenshot and, and, and the real true let's talk about what really happened. And the other beauty that I like about it is both Cat Williams and Monique came with receipts and see here's the thing when you when i looked at what when when this thing first became a big issue with monique because of the netflix special and all the things that started to come out with what was going on with her and lee daniels which had had to actually be true because lee lee daniels has personally come out and personally apologized for his role in uh what went on with monique uh there is now audio evidence of Tyler Perry admitting that he purposely lied on her uh, to damage her career. Uh, and so this stuff is coming up. There is evidence that Oprah literally was doing things to under undermine her and to make things difficult. And it's also showing up that this may be the case as far as certain actors like Taraji and what went on with uh, the remake of The Color Purple. And I've already talked about why it, you know, after its original launch day on Christmas tanked, um, just the push of trauma porn, which is Tyler Perry's um, claim to fame. He has rode the black woman victim being abused by the black man to unending lengths. Um, uh, and it has paid off well because there are so many hurt sisters that relate. And everybody wants to laugh. And you come pine the, the two and you get this thing. And he had the blueprint and he has ridden it into the ground. And I think the tailing off of the performance of those movies was the black community finally saying we've got enough. And there wasn't enough of a crossover audience to pick it up and basically whites have said look man we don't want all the trauma porn either that was shown by the fact that they didn't show up for the color purple and so that's it so a hundred million dollar budget produced 50 something million dollars total and there you have it uh but with monique again the first thing that i want to point out is she's a celebrity and so when I address celebrities, I am not the fact that she is still a celebrity isn't lost on me. Uh, so my goal is to look for what I see and can be verifiable truth, uh, just either through obvious receipts or observable patterns, uh, which is what I do for a living. And so, again, we st one of the things she talks about that Cat Williams talks about is the gatekeepers. And what you got to be very careful about here is not to get too caught up in the local representation of what was said. And what I mean by that, the immediate representation, the gatekeepers are the people that she's dealt with or that cat dealt with that sort of protects who can come in and who can benefit and what they've got to do in order to come in and benefit. But it's deeper than that. The gatekeepers are those they're going to determine who gets in they're going to be the ones say no monique ain't acting right so this is what we're going to do we're going to blackball or we're going to do this so you got gatekeepers you got the mid-range gatekeepers you got um you know the ones who are the black faces that we look at and i believe monique called them the juggernauts of black representation and obviously when i think about juggernauts of black representation the first one comes to mind in entertainment to me is Denzel Washington, Larry Fishburne, people that uh, I think are immaculate in what they produce in their work and those that I can't see where they've done dirt to other black people are promoted anti 
development and growth and empowerment behavior or information. Um, that is who I think of. But definitely when you think about, you know, power, we're talking about Tyler Perry, billionaire, talking about Oprah, billionaire, talking about Kevin Hart on his way, talking about Steve Harvey, somewhere around 240 million uh, in net worth. And so because we are so fixated on money and everything is about success, because I remember when Cat was on and uh, people were pulling out Steve Harvey's net worth and Cat Williams' supposed net worth. I'm going to tell you something. If, and this isn't making an argument for who's got the most money because I'm not counting either one, of their, either one of their pockets, but what I can tell you is if someone can accurately discern or determine your net worth, you're not a good, you're not doing a good job of moving, managing, and protecting your money. So I'm not saying who has what or who's got the most. But what I can tell you is when someone says, okay, this is what's going on. This guy's worth this amount. That guy's worth that amount. And the guy with the most money has to be the one that's right. Really doesn't understand how things work in this world. And I'm not in any way suggesting that. To, uh, in order to have a lot of money, you have to be shady. What I'm saying is money corrupts. Not in and of itself, not inherently, but the love of money, the thirst for money, the greed that comes along with it will corrupt. And I'll give you a prime example of Steve Harvey, which is the person that they were comparing his net worth to Cat Williams because Cat, Steve is one of the main ones that Cat went after. Um and Monique made sure to call him out and she right, rightfully so. I watched the interview and set up uh, that was literally planned when she when he brought her on his talk show uh, to reel her in and put her in her place because she was calling out Lee Daniels, Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry. Uh, again, Lee Daniels since acknowledged he was wrong, came out and apologized to her. They've actually done a project together. Um, and the thing is, Steve took her on there and, you know, basically ambushed her. And one of the things that Steve said when she started telling him right is right, and I'm a, you know, I'm gonna stand up for what I believe. And now keep in mind, there is an audience full of people who don't look like us. And he's telling her, when you are in a place where you need people, you have to humble yourself. I get that, but you gotta be careful when people start telling you that, because normally what they're trying to do is put you in a position where they can control you and manipulate you. It's one of the things they do. See, the thing is, me being humble does not mean being pliable. It's me understanding that there are some things I may have to do that my pride disagrees with sometimes, but it never means I move against my morals. It never means I compromise my character and integrity. It means that I have to be aware of the need of getting outside of my ego, but it does not mean I compromise. But he, he followed that statement to bring clarity to his position is when she said, no, I have my integrity. And he told her, you know, sometimes you got to put yourself, put your integrity aside and get that money. When you get that money, then you can worry about your integrity. He just told you in his addressing her what he did to get where he's at. And that's what Cat Williams called out. And everybody immediately measured the validity of that. Well, not everybody, a lot of people who don't want to see the people that they hold in high regard. There are a lot of Oprah fans. There are a lot of Tyler Perry fans. And there are a lot of things because why? The media shows you what they want you to see. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, because it'll be reframed and it'll be repushed and whole things. And the thing is, the media will show you what they want you to see. And so you're going to get 
Look at all this stuff that Tyler Perry did. Tyler Perry did this. Tyler Perry did that. Tyler Perry, and 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 if he did something virtuous, it, it should be acknowledged. I, I I I'm not one. Again, I'm here for the truth. So when he pays off something for somebody, or he helps some lady that uh, they were trying to take her house, that needs to be known. But you have to understand how much of a sacrifice is it I give to the homeless weekly. And it's regardless of how the money is flowing in my business, I'm there. I'm giving of my service. I'm giving of my time. I'm giving them food. I'm giving them clothing. I'm doing things. It never goes announced because this is about lifting them and it's not a photo shoot. It's not a photo opportunity. I work with kids weekly. For every symposium that you see filmed of me lecturing, there's a bunch of individual and group situations where I'm there and I'm giving of myself and it's not a photo op. It's about touching people's lives and the one thing you have to have to truly be an impact in someone's life is their trust. And if I'm there taking pictures so that those pictures can obviously be published, Am I just one more person who shows up in your world and does a photo op to tell everybody what they're doing and then you never see them again? I don't want that to be me. So I am very catchy. Now, people will still catch you or they'll be filming it on their own, but I'm not showing up with my crew filming it so that I could show that I did it. Uh, so, but it, when Tyler Perry did that, good, great. But you got to understand, Tyler Perry, let's just say, he gave $100,000. He's a billionaire. And I guarantee you it can be written off. I guarantee you that there are some other ways that the money can be uh, replaced. Uh, a bunch of different ways. Sponsorship. A bunch of different stuff. And you don't really know because you just get the the snapshot report on it. He did this. You don't know if he went to sponsors and say, hey, let's get together and we're going to do this to save this woman's house. And everybody got involved and Tyler Perry put his name, his stamp, and his brand on it. Happens all the freaking time. Nine times ten when something is being given away, the person, the money that's being given away, the thing that's being given away isn't being given away by the person doing it. It's through sponsorships. It's through th that type of thing. That's how business is done. Not saying anything's wrong with it, but I'm just saying doesn't it doesn't paint virtue. It paints activity it paints branding it's painting it's painting pr oprah is giving away cars and houses by the dozen it doesn't remove what we know we see now the thing is we are so tied up in living vicar i said this yesterday we're so tied up in living vicariously through the lives of celebrities that we become emotionally attached to them we become defensive of their positions because they are now in some kind of way literally spiritually connected to us because we've invested so much of our emotions into them because that's where we get our sense of success. We've stopped trying to be successful on our own. We've stopped trying to aspire and be. It's nothing wrong to look at somebody and say, if they can make it, I can make it. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with looking at somebody and say, I love the way they do something. But here's the thing, and Monique made this point, and this is one of the reasons why I felt it was important because she was honest in her assessment of the situation, but she was also honest in the assessment of herself. And what she said is, if we don't hold the juggernauts, the ones who hold the levers and the keys accountable, we can never see ourselves elevate. We can never see ourselves come. If we don't hold the biggest of us accountable, then there's no way to build because everybody's looking to them. And when you look to them, they're giving you a bad example of how to move. Well, if Tyler did that, why can't I do it? If Oprah did that, why can't I do it? That's how Steve Harvey got on. That's how Kevin Hart got on. So then, why don't we do it? And my thing is, again, like I said, she admitted that she's had to uh, apologize.
be accountable and own her stuff. Um, and I think at some point we all do. There is no perfect person. We've all made mistakes. We all have made moves that we uh, wish we would have made differently. It's life. It's how things happen. But what we must do is be able to sit up and say, you know what, I'm sorry. Uh, I've had to apologize to my children. I've had to apologize to uh, friends. I've had to apologize to business uh, partners. Uh, you, you you do things, and at the time, for whatever reason, uh, I'm not an ill intent person, so I, I've never gone out and purposely said, I'm finna just burn you. Uh, but you go out and you make decisions based on where you're at in your maturity and your experience and your knowledge and how you move, and then you look up and you see, okay, this didn't turn out the way I thought it would, and some people are hurt because of it, then I need to do the best I can to make amends. It does not mean that you mortgage your future to pay for your past. And what I mean by that is what same thing Monique said. Once I come to you and tell you I'm sorry, and I can tell you specifically what I'm sorry for. In other words, I'm not just lumping some general apology over it so that we can move on. I'm letting you know and acknowledge and I see what I've done. And once I do that, it's no longer in my in my court. I've done what I can. It's up to you to either accept it or dismiss it and then determine whether you want to move on with being connected with me or you want to sever ties. But either way, at the point that I acknowledge and I put it back in your court, it's no longer mine and I refuse to carry it. And this seems to be what's going on with her. But I'm, that's another part that I've got to go off into because it's not just about celebrity clashing. Uh, it's about her evolution and her growing up. Uh, and her husband, and I mean, he's got nothing but bashed because he's been the guy that won't let anybody mishandle her. And because we have been con 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 uh, conditioned, because we have been conditioned to be compliant, to fall in line, to not upset Massa. To, to do what we're supposed to do so we can get whatever they give us. You know, just be happy you're where you're at. Uh, no, the one thing that we talk about is knowing our worth and our value, but very rarely are we truly moving and operating and acting like we do. And what I mean by that is people would always say, hey, man, it's not professional showing up to that meeting in a t-shirt and a cap and sneakers it's not professional wearing a hoodie and it's you know and my thing is if it was a shirt and tie event if it was a formal event and people said this is a formal event i will show up in a formal attire if it's a business meeting i'm showing up to do business what i'm wearing has no bearing on it and the reason i can do it and i've gotten away with it for damn near 30 plus years is because i have the gold and one thing that my mentor taught me because i'm tatted because i wear earrings because despite how uh much i have between my ears i tend to present as especially in my younger years as i've aged and the whitest the white has come out uh maybe not as imposing but you can even see on the watch that I'm, I'm 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 tatted so if i got a short sleeve shirt on you definitely know and despite that my but, but he told me something he said that the only way that you're going to be taken seriously in the business world since you don't want to wear a suit since you want to move and operate in the way that you feel comfortable the only way you can do that is you have to get the goal he who has the goal makes the rules so then I decided to go out and get the goal. What's the goal? The goal is anything that they need to get what they need done that I'm an expert in. It makes me the person with the goal. So if you want it and you want it the way that I do it, then this is how I'm going to show up at the meeting. And what I can tell you is over the years, people that I've had multiple meetings with, companies I've had multiple meetings with, Multi-millionaire businessmen I've had uh, multiple meetings with tend to, as we progress in our relationship of meeting, become more and more casual. 
And I'm not saying they were mimicking me. What I'm saying is a lot of people are dressing up just because somebody told them they had to. And that people want to be comfortable. And my thing is, I move and think better when I'm comfortable. Now, when I get ready to clean up, I clean up well. My physique sits nice in suits. I just don't want to wear one every day. And I have the goal. So what Monique is saying is because she's the most decorated female comedian of all time. No, no most decorated comedian of all time. That's all the hardware you can get as a comedian. She's that chick. Literally, you can look it up. Um, and, you know, again, she's an Oscar winner, but she has all types of accolades, you know, that nobody probably pays attention to because, number one, she's a female versus a male. But, you know, uh, but anyway, she can do her job. And she knows that. And so when she goes in, because of the fact she knows her value and she won't settle for less, then it becomes her husband is a problem. Now, let me tell you something. As a man who takes being a husband um, is about as serious as I take anything. To me, it's the most honorable thing you can be in this world. I am a man. I am a black man. I never separate or divorce myself from my uh my blackness. I never will. Uh, I, I, I don't care how uncomfortable it makes people. Do I work with people who don't look like me? Absolutely. If I didn't, I would probably starve because my people don't know how to get behind the things that matter. And I'm not just talking about what I do at the Black Voice of the Odyssey Project. I'm talking about what I do for a living. Never had to haggle one white person or Asian person to pay me what my prices demand and I have yet to have a black person pay me for a price. But I love my people so I go in and I figure this stuff out. What am I saying about this? What I'm saying is her husband and the way she reveres him and knowing that that's not how it started. They've been friends from what I understand since they were 14 years old in high school. And he's always been her homeboy. They've been roommates. They've been everything else. They've, she's had his girlfriend. She's had her boyfriends and all this other stuff. That he, if you if you watched it, you watched it. If you didn't, you you should probably watch it. A lot of what I'm saying will make probably make more sense. But she talks about when she first got with him, she was who she used to be. Uh, she sat at the head of the table, you know. She made more money than him. She was the celebrity in the family. He was her manager, her her homeboy, her friend, her best friend, her manager. And one day he decided that he wanted to take on the role of loving her because he didn't feel like she was being loved right. And it was something that snapped. They went from a strictly platonic relationship to a romantic relationship. She said when it first started, she said at the head of the table, she said he didn't say anything. He just continued to be who he was. And she said one day it just didn't feel right sitting at the head of the table. And she sat to the side and he quietly sit there and it was never discussed. And she talked about how he loved her. She talked about how he, he speaks to her. He's never demanded submission. He's never demanded or uh, even spoke of the word role. He simply walks in who he is. And it automatically moves her. And I've talked about this over and over again. There's a continuous push in feminism to completely alienate the natural roles. And when you say roles, people lose their freaking mind like it's something wrong with it. No, if I'm built a certain way, that means I'm designed to do something a certain way. If you're built a certain way, it means you're designed to do something a certain way. And obviously, if we're built differently it means we're meant for different roles and the thing is we're so busy trying to prove who can do each other's roles that we've lost sight of how we operate optimally how we plug into one other one another how we take the feminine energy of the woman and the masculine energy of the man now don't get me wrong we each have both 
but the predominance is the masculine energy of the man. The feminine elements and components allows the connectivity, but it's the masculine that uh, allows for the power. It's the it's the masculine in her that allows the connectivity because it recognizes the the masculine in the man, but it's the feminine energy that allows for the power. Now, when you merge these, the two shall become one. When you merge these and you create one, you take the sinking of that masculine energy and feminine energy and you create a synergy, synced energy that creates a force and a power greater than the individual energies in themselves. And in that, you do things that neither person in and of themselves could do alone. First thing, raising kids. Producing, producing and then raising kids. It's not just a one-off event. It's not procreate and then do whatever. It's procreate, then inculcate. What I mean by inculcate, inculcate into the psyche of these children who they are. Inculcate into the psyche of these children their responsibility. Inculcate into the psyche of these kids what they are capable of in this world because see they're going to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and they need to know who they are at a level that they cannot be shaken they need to know who they are so that when people tell them not beautiful they're not beautiful they know when people tell them that they're not professional they realize who they are that their hair doesn't dictate their professionalism their behavior does And so all of these things come from when you have that natural environment and it is best managed and done with both masculine and feminine energy in the house. But right now we have a problem because there's an ongoing war because everybody's being fed by hostile triggers. Yeah, there's some bad guys out there. Straight trash. Yes, there's some shady ass trifling women out there. Straight trash. But that's not the majority. The vast majority of us are trying to figure this thing out. But we are being triggered by our own past pain. We're being triggered by our own past pain. We are being triggered by the things we have not dealt with. We are being triggered by epigenetic uh, influences that can be traced our way back to slavery because we've never truly dealt with it. And then there's this constant re-injury of trauma that's pushing things forward that then, then takes us to a place where we just want to strike out. And like anything, you strike out at what you can hit easiest. So you don't strike out at the real true cause. You strike out at what's in front of you. It's the easy thing. You point at it. And plus, who's a guy who at some point hasn't been deceived or tricked by a woman? Who is a woman at some point that hasn't been deceived, tricked, or abused by a man? It, and so it's easy to sit up and say, they're all like that. No, they're not. But they're, you're only going to get a heavy dose, Tyler Perry of the toxic ass, abusive ass black man and the victimized black woman who champions at the end and, and, and comes out on top. And we never deal with the real true issue. We never really deal with the real true situation. Um, she talked about her childhood being molested by her brother and how Oprah exploited that. Uh, she went on and, 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 and the quest, she at, answered the question, well, when are you going to stop talking about it, Monique? She says, I'm going to keep calling them out until they acknowledge it, what they did. Not her. She's already dealt with. She don't want to deal with her brother. She's already said she's done with her brother. But she's talking about how Oprah did what she did and how Tyler Perry did. And she uh, has acknowledged some people that have come out and did things for her. She, uh, I think, presented very well. I think she was very articulate. And what I loved about it is she challenged the people who are watching to use their own devices and their own minds to go look that stuff up. And that's one thing where we'll go find receipts. Um, I think another thing she did well was she acknowledged her humanity. And that was important. Uh, so in other words, she wasn't presenting as I'm always right and I'm always perfect and it's always everybody else. She's acknowledging her humanity. So uh, I think that's important. I think that uh, 
we one thing I look at is with the Cat Williams interview and the interview with Monique. I think that we ought to be very aware and just start to pay attention as stories start to come out uh, consistently. I think they will. I think this podcast platform thing is going to open up for a lot of truths to come out. And what we're going to find is a lot of stories can be traced back to uh, disruptive, abusive, and neglectful uh, childhoods. This is why I'm so big on adverse childhood experiences and epigenetic influences uh, as something that has long-term implications on health outcomes long after your childhood is over and the traumatic events it, it, events or events uh, themselves are over. So again, uh, this is really truly cathartic for them, but also very, very enlightening for those of us who want to look beyond the T, uh, as they say, as they say, and see the real, true dynamic at play. Uh, we really need to consume uh, more information that teaches us how to take control of our own affairs, how. Uh, to create and develop and manage the things that can lead us into a uh, position of ownership because in, in ownership comes power and in power becomes the capacity to liberate and empower ourselves. And so all this stuff we talk about doing as a people cannot be done through compliance to a system that has proven to be diametrically opposed to our well-being. And on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, man, and I'm pretty sure uh, filmmaker Tony uh, Lindsay and I are going to have a chance to really get together and I hope that we record it when we talk about it so that we can really truly uh, create a, a discussion around this that is beyond a monologue like the one you're getting now. So I'm excited about that. But I had to touch on it before I got away. I got to get ready because I got a client coming up in about 30 minutes. But I wanted to touch on that. Again, uh, if you believe in the work we're doing at the Odyssey Project and all of its elements and components in the community, um, from uh, our rite of passage program, Black Men Lead, to dealing with uh, domestic violence and abuse, mental health issues, advocacy for uh, children in the public school systems, advocacy for people who are incarcerated and being mishandled or wrongfully uh, prosecuted and on and on all of those things we've done for years we will continue to do uh, but it does require resources uh, so again thank you look in the description box it will tell you the ways that you can give and on that note i'm out of here you guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be free.